Thank you, Fraser. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I wouldn't say I had a great knowledge of the history of this area, Fraser, but here we are. Uh, my interest in the um, UVF was, was really through uh, the men from the Larne Battalion who joined up in the 36th Ulster Division. But when Bobby had asked me if I would do a few things for him, I decided that I'd have to do a bit of research. So really what I'm going to tell you here is what was reported in the newspapers of the day. But it's, it's most appropriate that uh, we're meeting here in Victoria Orange Hall for a historic, a historical celebration of the formation of Carson's Army. As well as playing its part in the, in the training, the volunteers also hosted some divine services. And it situated close to where other historical events took place in Larne during that period. <coughs> Behind us, as most of you know, was Dramalis, which was a home and estate of the Smiley family, who had originally came from Scotland. Unfortunately, Sir Hugh Smiley died in 1909, but his wife, Dowager Lady Elizabeth, continued to live there for many years. Lady Elizabeth showed great kindness and support towards the volunteers and allowed her estate to be used for training, drilling and hosting of many other events associated with them. Sir Edward Carson, I don't know whether a lot of you know, but was a long-standing friend of the Smileys and he was a regular visit to Dramalis. And it is commonly believed that the gun running operation in 1914 was actually plotted and expedited around the table in the dining room and Dramalis here behind us. And that was with the approval of Lady Smiley. And then of course just outside the front door here, a few hundred yards down to the left, uh, was that amazing night of the gun running that took place at Larne Harbour. <clears throat> Now, I might be overlapping a wee bit with Fraser, but I hope you'll excuse me if I do. Uh, but the Ulster Volunteer Force grew out of the Orange Order and Unionist Clubs to oppose home rule, and they'd start to drill by March 1912. There was no overall command structure in the province for the volunteers, so as to rectify this situation, in January 1913, the Ulster Unionist Council decided that the volunteers should be united into a single body. Now, the fact that this step was taken by the Ulster Unionist Council and not the Grand Lodge of Ireland may be explained by the fact that although all Orange men were Unionists, all Unionists weren't Orange men. Recruitment was to be limited to 100,000 men and restricted to those between 17 and 65 years of age. With the arrival of Lieutenant Gen General Sir George Richardson in June 1913, a regimental system was to be established. The four Belfast parliamentary constituencies, that's the North, South, East and West, and Londonderry City, were each to be treated as counties, given a total of 14, each division was to consist of a variable number of regiments according to volunteer strength and each regiment was for the same reason to consist of a various number of battalions. Now, back one of the most imposing and early demonstrations ever held in Ireland took place at the Bank Heads and that was in July 1912 and it was organised by the Larne Unionist Club and had an assembly numbering between three and four thousand and that was to register a protest against the Home Rule Bill. Uh, this was preceded by a parade of about 500 accompanied by three bands and about, and I, I find this hard to believe, but about halfway up the bank heads a platform had been erected and the speeches were delivered from there and I can just imagine a platform halfway up the bank heads. Now one of the, the speakers that day was uh, Reverend John Lyle Donachie, who's well known to the people of Larne. He was a minister of First Larne Presbyterian Church. The, uh, as I said, you know, whenever the, the uh, volunteers were structured and uh, Larne became, as you can see by the flag here, Larne became the second battalion of the Central Antrim Regiment. 
and uh, the battalion itself consisted of officers and seven companies of men plus the stretcher section and the nursing corps. And you can see there's a photograph of the nursing corps at Ramallah Spine at the back there. <coughs> Uh, and as well as a lot of instruction and drilling, the battalion took place in a number of parades in the area. By the way, the companies in Larne were A1 Larne, which was centred around the Main Street area, A2, which I think was around the head of the town, and then you had C, which was Larne Harbour, D Kilwater, E Glen, F Kern Castle, and G Newington, which is up around the factory district. But on the Sunday afternoon in June 1913, a strong contingent paraded for a divine service at Glynn. The service was held on the hillside overlooking the Glynow Road in the village, where a temporary platform had been erected. And the service was conducted by the Reverend Shirley, the rector of Glynn, and he was the commander of the Glynn Company. Now, there were also ones from Relu and Clawater at that service. And in October the same year, they assembled at Larne Market Yard to parade the Dramalis for inspection by the Colonel Commanding uh, Major McCammond. This parade was led by Chains True Flit Band, True Bruce Flit Band, and arrived at Dramalis, they were met by Dowager Lady Smiley, who kindly put at their disposal her grounds for training and drilling. And the chief instructor of drill, and I'm sure it's her name, a lot of certainly uh, a lot of people who but come to this hall years ago would remember was Mr. George Mann. I can remember dancing in this hall and George was sitting on the platform here and he were dancing to the best bands in, in Britain because he was playing records and the place was packed usually every Tuesday night. But George was complimented in the results uh, that had been witnessed and the discipline of the corps and the drilling was magnificent. And of course the night of Friday the 24th of April is a date that will find a permanent place in the hist pages of history. It was in this night that the Mount Joy of Clyde Valley landed at Larne Harbour with a consignment of thousands of guns and millions of rounds of ammunition to arm the Ulster Volunteer Force. Prior to the landing, members of the Ulster Volunteers have been notified that they were immediately to go to stated points to discharge such duties as might be allocated to them. A like order had been issued to local companies and the local land company they were called to Dramalis here where they were to be given their instructions. And their volunteers stretching from Larne away to the north, to the west, to the south. And the result was that by 8 o'clock from Belfast to Larne the entire coast road was under close patrol by strong bodies of pickets posted at intervals. The roads leading to Glenarm, Ballyclare, Ballymena, etc. were similarly manned and everything was in readiness for beginning operations. A total of 570 cars, and I find this hard to believe, there were 570 cars actually passed down that road, past this hall, and they were employed to distribute the guns as they were landed. Pickets were out in all roads directing the cars to and from Larne Harbour and hardly had the hatches of the ship been removed when great sturdy fellows, many of whom who had completed the day's work, they stripped off to their shirts and got down and joined the crew in unloading the car cargo. As each car was loaded they quickly dispersed to distribute the guns across the country and the whole operation was an unqualified success. The newspapers of the day reported, what will they say in England? Larne was a scene of an achievement unsurpassed for organisation, for bravery, for discipline, and shall it be added, for sheer audacity. As the Mount Joy drew away from Larne Harbour, her skipper and crew stood the attention and they shouted from the ship, three cheers for the king and three more for the volunteers. And this was heartily responded to by those on the shore. Edward Carson, whenever he heard of this, the, the, the landing of the arms at Larne, he was reported to have said, Magnificent! Magnificent! Nothing could have been better done. It was a piece of organisation that any army in Europe might be proud of. And after the gun running, it was back to drilling and parading. 
And to celebrate Empire Day in May 1914, a divine service was to be held in this hall here. And it was to be conducted by the Reverend D. H. Hansen, who was a minister of Garden Ward Presbyterian Church. Nearly 800 people of the Larne Battalion assembled in the Larne Market Yard to parade the Orange Hall. And I find it hard to find see, 800 people in this hall. Of course, there's a balcony there at that time. But it was some turnout. But the whole force was under the command of Mr. William Chain. And a novel addition to the parade was the appearance of the Nursing Corps. And there's a photograph of the Nursing Corps down in one of the tables there. And it was formed and connects with a battalion under the command of Mrs. Hansen. The ladies assembled at Dramalis, which was being used as their headquarters by kind permission of Dowager Lady Smiley. And she took an active interest in the formation of the Corps. And escorted by a company of volunteers, they marched to the hall before the arrival of the battalions. And the red letter day in the history of the town of Larne was in July 1914 when Sir Edward Carst, although he had visited from Oz before, but he was a unionist leader obviously then, he was on the weekend visit to Lady Smiley Dramalis when he inspected the Larne, Ballyclare and Carrick Fergus battalions and those were the central Antrim regiments of the UVF. And he watched on as the colours were presented to each of the battalions. The colours to Ballyclare were presented by uh, Mrs. Robert McCallman and to the Larne Battalion the second, they were presented by the Dowager Lady Smiley and the Carrick Fergus Battalion, the colours were presented by Mrs. George Kirk. Now on that day, escorted by 30 members of the Spatch Riding and Signalian Corps, Sir Edward had earlier arrived from Belfast to Dramalis and the approaches of which were closely guarded by members of the local UVF. And though the ceremony at Dramalis was not time to begin until late afternoon, crowds of visitors arrived early in the morning, and the streets were decorated. Apparently it was like a twelfth day. Not only had they single arches about the town, but in some places they had triple arches. <clears throat> and that parade to Dramalis was under the command of Major R. McCammond. And all about 2,000 men plus 200 members of the UVF Medical and Nursing Corps were in attendance. And the majority of men on parade appeared fully armed. And a novel feature of the procession was the presence of a machine gun mounted on the back of a motor car. And again, that photograph is there at the back. You can have a look at it. After the presentation of the colours, Sir Edward gave his address and publicly thank Major Crawford who had been present that day for the great part he played from start to finish in the whole achievement of the gun running in April that year. Now, in the months leading up to the outbreak of the First World War, Ulster's blood pressure was very high. Down south, the Irish volunteers, they were also planning and to bring in guns and the Houth, they brought in thousands of guns at Houth and they also recruited about 180,000 men and they were committed to defending home rule from the menace of an armed UVF. But on the 4th of August 1914 things changed and the First World War broke out. And the beginning of the war changed things, and two days after being appointed Secretary of State for War and being aware that the UVF had become a very formidable and powerful force, Lord Kitchener had sent for Colonel T. E. Hickman, who was an MP, and he was President of the British League for the Defence of Ulster, and he said to him, I want the Ulster Volunteers. Hickman recommended that Kitchener speak to Carson and Creed. If the UVF was to be thrown into the recruitment pot, Carson and his friends, if I can turn the page here, wanted to ensure they would be kept together as much as possible as a unit. Also, they wanted the prefix ulcer to become, to be, to be accompany the number of the proposed grade. On the 3rd of September 1914, at an Ulster Unionist Council meeting in Belfast, Carson announced the formation of what was to be the 36th Ulster Division. 
And the scene was set for the Ulster volunteers if they so wished to express their loyalty to the Crown and their fighting spirit as part of the British Army with which just a few months ago they had been preparing to do battle. So three infantry brigades and 12 battalions in all were to be formed. And a lot of three all the, uh, the brigades, but it was not long before men from a Larn company enlisted. And most of the 138 officers and men uh, who formed the 2nd Battalion of the Larn group, uh, they joined up in the 12th Battalion, which was a mid antrim battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles. A number of brothers joined together were George and Samuel Fullerton of Main Street, Alec and Thomas Owen, Point Street, uh, H. R. Barkmar, 13 Fleet Street, Alec and John Owens, 23 Clon Lee, Robert Thomas and William Torment of Torment of 153 Ogden Arm Road. And a newspaper of the day described the family of Mr. and Mrs. Torment as a patriotic family who had shown it in an unmistakable manner. Their three sons, Robert, William and Thomas, have enlisted in the 12th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles. And their daughter, Miss Mary Turbot, is a member of the Factory District of the Nursing Corps. Unfortunately, William was killed at the Battle of the Somme. But another three brothers was James, Matthew and William Weir of Nine Coronation Terrace. And Matthew and William were killed in the First World War. <coughs> Lots, lots of the men from Larne and from the battalion who had been killed were killed at the Battle of the Somme, unfortunately. And uh, the 25 from the Larne UV, UVF were killed at the Somme. 11 of them were never found and they're commemorated on the Teepful Memorial. And uh, by the way, a total of 40 men from Larne they were killed and their bodies were never found or commemorated on the Tateful Memorial. Now, after the song, the, the division moved to Messines and there they fought alongside the 16th Irish Division and it was a very successful battle that. And uh, it was in that battle, uh, and, and it's ironic that there they were with the 16th Irish Division and they were fighting alongside men who they might have been fighting against a few months earlier. But it was in that battle that Major William Redmond uh, was wounded, badly wounded. Uh, his brother Tom was the leader of the Irish Nationalists. And William was carried off the battlefield by members of what would have been the, the UVF in those days. And actually the minister who ministered to him, he actually died after the wounds. Uh, he was the 36th Division Chaplain. Um, then the, the uh, battalion, the uh, 36th Ulster Battalion, they moved through Eves and Passchendaele. And Passchendaele, I remember my father telling me it was worse than so. He says that the muck and all of his men actually drowned in the craters in, in Passchendaele. I think anybody who's he's been around the Ypres area and, and to the men in Gate, uh, nearly every corny torn outside Eep, you'll see military cemeteries. And the men in Gate itself, there's 10 Larn men commemorated on, they were Ulster volunteers as well. And there's 54,896 names on the memorial. And then if you go to Tank Cod, which is the largest uh, Commonwealth war grave cemetery in the world, there's 11,500 graves. And also on the walls around it, there's 34,800 odd names. And after that, they, they moved to, on to Cambria. And last year, we had a lady whose granda had been the, the, the current, I think the third battalion, uh, the Central Anthem. And her granda had been killed in the First World War. And he was commemorated on the Cambria Memorial at Louverville. She had never been out before and neither had any of the family. Now she was very good at writing poetry and I can remember well uh, she had written a poem uh, about her grand and as we approached the Cambria Memorial she started to read it. And it was, the poem was called I Have Come to Say Hello and I tell you 
when she finished sweeping up full, there was hardly a dry eye in the bus. But again, there's another eight Lauren mem commemorated in that. So on we go to uh, San Quentin, uh, which the Kaiser's bottle. Now the Germans had, they had signed a pact with Russia. So it meant they were able to bring hundreds of thousands of men from the Russian front to San Quentin. And there was there, they, they hoped to break through, uh, which they did. And of course, at the very front, for the 36th Ulster Division. And uh, there was the largest bombardment ever seen in the Western Front that the Germans laid upon the 36th that day. And of course, lots of them were captured. There were hundreds and hundreds of them were captured. And uh, one of them was my father. And there's a wee story I'm telling that he told me, and he didn't, he didn't speak that often about it, except he had a few Guinness in him, you know. But he told me about the day he was captured. It was a very heavy mist. And they were completely surrounded because the Germans, they were, there were such numbers of them, they were completely overwhelmed. But as he was being taken up to the Marshall area, and there was another group of men on the, the side, and I heard this shout. Now, my father, as you know, McNeil was called Neeler for nickname. And he heard this shout from the group and said, They got you now, Neeler. And he looked across, and there was a wee man, Tom McGorn, who had a Barber shop and learned here. As a matter of fact, I was with his grandson there. He cut a few of my locks there the other day. It was amazing that. But the Germans broke through there and they swept right through the Somme area again and they were eventually stopped at VA Britain, just short of Amion by the Australian Army. Of course, after that, they were then pushed, uh, pushed back and back and back until on November the 11th, 1914. And a railway carries a compian and armistice was signed so the men could return home. But the 36th Ulster Division had quite a lot of distinctions. Uh, now, for example, they, they won nine Victoria Crosses, 71 Distinguished Service Orders, 459 Military Crosses, 173 Distinguished Conduct Medals, 1,294 Military Medals, 118 Meritorious Service Medal and 312 Foreign, that was French and Belgian, etc. And some of the Larnman who were <coughs> awarded distinctions uh, were Adam Greenwell, I don't know, I think his grandson was the be here tonight, I don't know where he, whether it is or not, but he was awarded the Belgian Croix de Guerre. And uh, uh, Sergeant Simon McKeever, was a, he was won the military medal. And Herbert Borgmar, whose daughter is here this evening, he was a martyr the military medal. And I just read out here uh, about it. It's with great gratification we record that the military medal has been awarded to Herbert Borgmar of the 12th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, a son of Mrs. Borgmar, Fleet Street Larne. He was in charge of a machine gun on the 1st of July when he displayed great gallantry and was responsible for the capture of a batch of 13 Germans. Coming through unscathed, he was promoted to sergeant for his distinguished conduct and has since been advanced to quartermaster sergeant. And the award now is added in recognition of his bravery. A member of the Larne Harbour Company of EVF, he and his brother were among the earliest Larne enlistments. His brother, rifleman Richard Bergmar, was badly wounded on the 1st of July and after a long spell of surgical treatment is now back at Clandyboy. Quartermaster Sergeant Bergmar will receive the sincere congratulations of a large circle of friends. <clears throat> now, one of the other people who had won the military medal was a William A. McGill. And I'm very sorry because I had it in my possession this morning and I misled it. It was a wee note that I'd got from his sister, who was a Mrs. Hill from Carson Street. And at the time she sent me this note that it was about six or seven years ago. She was 93 years of age. But I'm very sorry I missed it. But what she, she put in it, you know, her feelings, you know, whenever they, they had heard that he had died and all, and uh, tell me and the what sort of a person he was. And for example, she was saying one time in Belgium he met this wee girl, wee child, and he wanted to bring her home. And uh, But he got his military medal because he 
Uh, one night they'd been told that his uh, his officer was lying wounded out in no man's land. And he went out in the darkness and uh, very near the, the German lines and went out to try and rescue him, which he eventually did. But she, then she also said about he used to receive parcels from it was the daughters, two daughters of a minister here, I think it was the church down the road here. He used, really used to look forward to receiving those parcels. And then she mentioned about the time they were told about the, uh, the, his death. He was apparently blown to pieces and he's commemorated on the Tate Memorial. Ladies and gentlemen, I could have said a lot more, but what they cut short, we should be very proud of all the volunteers who initially were prepared to take up arms against home rule and then took up arms to fight for king and country, with many of them making the supreme sacrifice. We will remember them. Thank you.